thou seeketh soul power, dost thou not? Then touch the demon inside me. This land is peaceful, its inhabitants kind, but thou dost not belong. Of course, I do love you. Isn't that how you've made me? Farewell, Ashen One. May the flames guide thee. Hidetaka Miyazaki grew up in Shizuoka, Japan. At an early age, Miyazaki discovered a passion for reading novels and manga. He was thoroughly enchanted by the stories and worlds presented in the novels of H.P. Lovecraft, the manga of Kentaro Miura, and various game books like Sorcery. But he lived in a household that struggled more than a little financially. So to keep up with his hobby, he would often borrow books from his local library. Occasionally, he would bring a book home to discover they were, at best, beyond his reading comprehension, or, at worst, damaged. As such, he would have to use his imagination to fill in the gaps and complete the stories as best he could. As Miyazaki grew up and entered college at Keio University, he found himself feeling somewhat directionless. It was this lack of a hard focus that pushed him into pursuing a social studies degree before finding himself working as an account manager at Oracle. He remained here for several years, but that sense of aimlessness remained. Until one day, a friend lent him a small stack of games, which, among other things, included a copy of the minimalist masterpiece Aiko. Miyazaki himself has said of it, That game awoke me to the possibilities of the medium. I wanted to make one myself. Before long, he quit his job at Oracle and began hunting for a job in game development. One thing I really want to emphasize here is how exceptional this is. For those of us in the West, and especially America, stories of people dropping their high-paying jobs to pursue their dreams is a fairly standard tale, though not exceptionally common in real life. In Japan, however, this is almost unheard of. Typically, you find a company, and you stick with them for nearly your entire career. Changing fields, especially at Miyazaki's senior age of 29, with only seven years experience in the corporate world under his belt, zero of those years in gaming, and just a degree in social studies in hand is a rare sight to say the least. But Miyazaki had finally found something to chase after, and after a difficult time job hunting, he was able to land a job at From Software, where he began work as a planner on Armored Core Last Raven. The staff at FromSoft were almost immediately impressed by Miyazaki. His choice to leave his old job behind to pursue games, combined with his constant suggestions for design improvements on Last Raven, brought him to the forefront of the staff's mind. Before long, he found himself as director for Armored Core 4 as well as Armored Core 4 Answer. However, during development of 4 Answer, an odd opportunity presented itself to Miyazaki. You see, around this time, FromSoft began to work on a spiritual next-gen sequel to their Kingsfield series, and by all accounts, the early stages of development were a train wreck, and more importantly, a train wreck no one wanted to be responsible for. The prototype build was unremarkable, and the dev team was struggling to figure out how to make this game worthwhile. Miyazaki, upon discovering this, saw his chance. When I heard it was a fantasy action role-playing game, I was excited. I figured if I could find a way to take control of the game, I could turn it into anything I wanted. Best of all, if my ideas failed, nobody would care. It was already a failure. And so it was that Miyazaki found himself at the helm of two drastically different games at once. And while 4 Answer would come out to a respectable reception, it was the other game that would begin to bring his name into gaming's mainstream. Demon Souls was released in 2009. What started as a respectable success selling nearly 40,000 copies in its first week, quickly exploded as word of mouth and localized copies began to spread. The game's challenge served as its biggest talking point, but the people who played it quickly discovered its difficulty was simply the bones to its innovative meat. With the game sporting airtight combat, a completely unique style of multiplayer, and perhaps the most rich gothic atmosphere since Diablo 2, it quickly found itself with a die-hard cult following. But while the game would go on to sell nearly 2 million units over the course of its lifespan, it was clear to everyone involved that while they'd struck gold, there was far more to be mined. A sequel was inevitable, and no one else was more qualified to direct it than the man who had started all of this. But no one could be prepared for the success that followed.
Dark Souls changed everything. Not only for Miyazaki himself, but the broader gaming scene at large. Having been released in 2011, only time will tell of Dark Souls' true influence, but its impact on the modern gaming scene is undeniable. Its influence can be seen in games ranging in scale from Destiny to Shovel Knight, and sparked an entirely new subgenre of Souls-like games. The game's fame has become so ubiquitous that one of the most quintessential features of almost any game, difficulty, has become synonymous with the title. You think your game is hard? Is it Dark Souls hard? Most of all, it showed just how potent word of mouth can be. If Demon Souls was a cult hit, then Dark Souls is a fully formed religion, complete with proselytizing zealots, anti-zealots, scripture, and priests. A cottage industry of theorists, writers, and entertainers sprung up around the game. Before long, it became one of the most openly talked about and beloved games of the new decade, and, combined with his work on Demon Souls and its own surprisingly high sales, brought Miyazaki's name into the gaming mainstream. Four months after the release of the game's fan-petitioned Windows port, Dark Souls 2 was announced. To the surprise of many, however, it was revealed that it would not be directed by Miyazaki. Instead, his next project would be something a little... bleaker. With its focus on Bram Stoker chills, Lovecraftian horror, and aggressive combat, Bloodborne's release was celebrated by fan and critic alike, with many declaring it to be the PS4's killer app. However, while Bloodborne was celebrated, Dark Souls 2 didn't bode quite as well. Critics were happy with the game, but fans felt Miyazaki's absence. Several gameplay changes combined with a misleading ad campaign and a mysterious problem with VAC bands on the PC port caused many fans to come to the opinion that, ultimately, Dark Souls 2 simply wasn't up to the standards set by the games that came before it. So with the final Souls game on the horizon, it was clear that Miyazaki would have to be the one to finish what he started. And with the release of Dark Souls 3 in 2016, that's exactly what he would do. In many ways, Dark Souls 3 stands as a brilliant combination of the original Dark Souls and Bloodborne, taking the patient combat and colder world of the former, and fusing it with the grotesque monsters and open levels of the latter. A kind of berserk by way of Lovecraft. This fusion, along with the narrative themes of the game itself, grant Dark Souls 3 a very strong feeling of a chapter coming to an end. Everything from the purposefully rehashed characters, to the horrifying mutation of traditional enemies, to the ending itself all give off an atmosphere of a tired world that has run through its cycles one too many times, and now needs to rest, before it all comes crashing down once and for all in a way that can never be undone. This could be read as an allegory for why the Soul series itself needs to stop for a while. But what's fascinating is that while the ending seems to explore this idea directly, Miyazaki seemed to be able to convey nearly all of this before that, through tone alone, and that's where Miyazaki's true strength lies. All of Miyazaki's games, from Demon Souls onward, all display a mastery of tone, or atmosphere as it tends to get called in gaming circles. For all of the praise his games writing, art direction, and combat get, what frequently gets overlooked is that, as good as all of those elements are, they all interlock and build on each other flawlessly. The story and lore are incredibly well written and stunningly consistent, but that lore would have less impact if the art design of the world and enemies didn't reflect what was in the writing. Things like the steps in Anne Orlando and Seath's mutilated body all add gravity to the words of the lore, which makes the world at large feel more real. Both of these factors, in turn, make the combat more engaging. By granting the enemies you engage and the armor and weapons you engage them with a history, which gives each encounter, especially boss battles, a sense of grandeur, or at least intrigue. There aren't just random zombies. These are hollows, something you yourself are fated to become. And they may very well have had a trial as harrowing as yours that still led them to this dead, empty land. This isn't just a greatsword. It was the weapon wielded by Ludwig of the Healing Church before his blood-drunk nature caused him to fall into the Hunter's Nightmare. This isn't just some random warrior. He's a failed unkindled who arrived too late to kindle the flame. So he seeks to test all who think they are worthy of an attempt to become the next champion of Ash. Because you learn these things, you understand the world. But due to the way you have to learn them, you don't understand it enough to have a complete grasp of it. From there you begin filling in the gaps on your own, just as Miyazaki did with his childhood books, leading to this sense of a world that is far bigger than the one you're looking at, and assumptions to what the world is and was like, thereby crafting the tone. Vagueness is his canvas, 
This vagueness, however, serves not only a tonal purpose, but a narrative one as well. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of Death of the Author, but for those of you who haven't, let me explain very briefly. Back in 1967, a literary theorist named Roland Barthes wrote an essay that railed against the idea of, when analyzing an artistic work, looking at the artist's life, statements, and personality. Rather, he felt we should opt to focus on the work itself, pure and simple. And by doing that, we become the author just as much, if not more, than the person who put pen to paper. In other words, it doesn't matter if tomorrow Jonathan Blow came out and said, Braid is about the atomic bomb because your reading of what he presented could be drastically different from what he claims it means. But that doesn't inherently make it less valid. The creator is dead, and the writing is alive. And there may be no other designer working today who encourages this approach more than Miyazaki. In an interview with VG247, Miyazaki stated, First of all, yes, there is a perfect storyline in my head. However, I have no intention at all of enforcing that storyline to the players out there. Only those storyline elements that actually make it into the game are something that I need to force players to accept as a base for building up their interpretation of the world. There are things in my head that aren't in the game, after all. So, after all, it's up to the players. I have no intention in enforcing any of the storyline upon any of the players out there. And there will be no official statements made about the true story of the game. I have seen interpretation after interpretation of all of the Souls games. Most of all, though, the original Dark Souls. I've seen people read it as a tale about the inevitable heat death of the universe, I've seen people view it as a will to power parable, and I've seen people read it as an allegory for depression. And none of these readings line up with my own personal reading of what it means to me. There are people who have made entire careers and entire communities that have arisen out of crafting readings of this game. And none of this would have been possible without Miyazaki's deep belief in death of the author. Most of all, I feel his design approach can be summed up in one word. Respect. Miyazaki respects you enough to believe you'll be able to beat his games. He respects you enough to believe you'll pick up on all of the little clues and story threads scattered throughout the world. And he respects you enough to believe that you'll think about what he's presented to you, what it means, and most of all, what it means to you. He respects you enough to trust you'll be just as skilled at being a discerning audience as he is at being a discerning designer. And between the dozens of analysis channels, the piles of articles, and the awe-inspiring mountain of threads dissecting and exploring his games, I think it's safe to say that we've lived up to the challenges Hidetaka Miyazaki laid out for us.